So good evening, everybody. My name is Yasmin Majid, and I'm one of the WIT directors. We have several on the call, including Audrey, um, who is our chair, Annette Nababi, Helen Kaliski, and Michelle Seneca de Fonseca. So there's several of us on the call. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's WIT event focused on tech and climate change. Um, this is the first time we're doing a panel event online. So apologies in advance if we have any sort of bumps along the way, but thanks so much for joining us. For those who are new to WIT, or rather Women in Telecoms and Technology, WIT was founded 20 years ago um, by a group of women execs all working in the comms and tech industries in the UK. And it's an informal networking group focused on education and enhancing women's careers. So our group meets every other month, usually in person in London. And um, we have just over 2,000 members, including women at all stages in their careers, in large and small organizations, um, covering all kinds of uh, roles, everything from lawyers, consultants, accountants, through to engineers and entrepreneurs. So quite a, 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 ver a variety there. Um, although WIT was formed by and for women, um, I'd like to emphasize that everyone is welcome uh, to attend our events and to uh, join us as member. Okay, so just em emphasizing that because we do have all women today, but anyone is welcome. Welcome. Um, okay, moving on. Um, uh, we've got everybody off and on mute, which is great. If you speak to speaker view in the top right hand corner, you'll see um, it'll enable you to see a person speaking and the speakers of, of, of the panel above that above you. So you won't see everybody. So you might have a better view. So you might want to uh, uh, test that out for yourselves. Um, once we move into Q&A, we can all turn our cameras back on and ask questions um, and see each other. Um, during the talk also, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat window. Um, we'll save them up to the end or else if you just want to um, make a mention of the fact that you have a question for the end, you can ask it yourselves, okay? And just a reminder that we are recording tonight's session, just so that you're aware of that. So tech and climate change. Um, the tech sector has had and continues to have a significant impact on the environment and climate change. We're all aware of that. We've seen the numbers grow at an alarming rate with the proliferation of technology, devices, and data, and everything that goes into production and use. Adding to that, you've got the emissions relating to the storage of data, um, processing, and of course, the eventual disposal of waste required, all that tech waste that's created every year. Um, companies are feeling pressure from their employees, customers, advocacy groups, and in some cases, governments to take action. So in response, tech companies in particular are making significant inroads in tackling climate issues. I don't know if we're all the way there yet. I think we, we've actually got a, long, a lot more work to do here, but um, these companies are addressing their own emissions in various ways, offsetting them, with the planting of trees, green energy, um, and so on. They're also operating more efficiently to reduce emissions and energy consumption and helping their customers to do likewise, okay? We're seeing large scale commitments. I think yesterday, well, I know yesterday, Google claimed that it is the first major company to effectively eliminate its entire carbon footprint, dating back to its inception. So that's, I think, fairly impressive. And several months earlier, Microsoft made a commitment to do the same thing um, by 2030. Um, you've got other companies such as Amazon uh, making a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2040. And in June, Apple announced that its devices would be carbon neutral by 2030. So you've got a lot of big names who are joining the movement. Lots of commitment, lots of names. Questions are, how are we gonna see these targets achieved? And, and um, that's why I'm delighted to say we've got a panel of experts uh, tonight who are gonna help us see some of what's being done to address this climate challenge. We'll first hear from Kate Rosenshine from Microsoft. Microsoft. She'll speak on um, Microsoft's carbon negative commitment and as well on how Microsoft is helping customers to think differently. Um, next, we'll hear from Amy Danielle from NTT. She'll speak on advances being made in um, data center space to support the delivery of greener services. Um, then we'll hear from Kimberly Wells from the law firm Bird & Bird, who will share a case study around electric vehicles. She's going to focus on how we can leverage technology and regulation to drive green innovation. And finally, Janet Gunter from the Restart Project 
will speak on the work she and her organization have been doing in reducing e-waste in a very accessible way. So welcome everybody, welcome panelists, and um, why don't we kick off? Um, so um, Amy, um, do you want to uh, get off please? Sure, thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor for you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, and I do have some reference to have around that point later on, kind of in, in what I was thinking about saying to, to this wonderful group today. Um, and I suppose I'm a big fan of brevity when I'm speaking, especially on panel sessions, etc. because I really want to open the conversation out. So I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna speak for the whole time because I'd love to get some questions from, from the group and see whether there are any um, points that you'd like to dive into, et cetera. Um, but but I, I suppose we all know um, that data centers have had a, a lot of spotlight on them over the, uh, over the last number of years. And certainly in the time that I've been in the industry, the comprehension of what a data center is has really changed with the general public. And that comes with its own challenges. I mean, all of a sudden, um, the amount of energy that the data center industry uses is published all over the over planet. Everyone knows. Uh, I was in a, a cafe where I lived the other day and a child was talking to his parents about using Fortnite, um, the game. And I, I don't know if anyone has teenage children, but I believe Fortnite is, a, is a, a big thing at the moment. And I was talking about playing with friends in Sweden and the US and all over the place. And he said, oh, but then the data center that we were playing on had a failure, so we lost our game. And I was like, oh my goodness, there we are. We, we have a 15-year-old here who is so aware of, of the way that um, those types of online platforms are actually being hosted. He doesn't think that the cloud is a fictitious place. He understands that the cloud is actually something um, that exists, which is really very different from, from how I started in the industry. And I suppose it, after a, a decade of either designing or building and, and now brief time of Microsoft and into NTT where we're working to really change the way that we look at data centers. I've seen so much change. We, the first data center that I was involved in was 500 square meters. And at the time we thought that was humongous. Now I'm building two and a half thousand square meters for a single customer on a single phase deployment and it, it's, it's not even touching the sides of what they have with us ac across the entire portfolio. So the scale of what we're building is really, really changing. But from an environmental perspective, actually I think the impact that we're having on the environment is getting much better. There's a lot more spotlight on it. And for years, many people across the industry have, have really been pushing a lot of environmental improvements. And I don't want to be throwing too many acronyms out, and I don't know how many engineers we have on the call, so I'll try not to uh, stick to too many of, of the, the weird data acronyms, but there's a particular um, metric that we use when, when we're operating data centers, and that's all around set point temperatures. And it really is the temperature at which we operate our white space environment. Um, the Why that's important is 10, 15 years ago, when, when data centers were brand new, we were having to put warm jackets on to go into a data center because they were at 17, 18, 19 degrees centigrade. Now we're running them actually within kind of the ASHRAE allowable, but at 32 degrees centigrade, we've got evidence from Google that they haven't even bothered to put any cooling to into some of their data centers in, in the Nordic region. And actually, and this is an actually interesting point and, and where I was gonna shoehorn the Microsoft um, discussion in, it's a well-known metric that the 83% or so of failures within data centers are due to human error. And actually by Google running their data center in, um, in the Nordics with no cooling, actually the data center is very, very hot. And so the technicians going in there wear these funny little suits. So does that suggest that as an industry, we're trying to take people out of the technical white space, relying more on technology to shift workloads, to actually understand how the, the ecosystem of data center works and having to interact with it far less, which is where I come to the Microsoft Submersion project. Very interesting there because actually when you, when you read into the press release they made, their failure rate was far lower than a lot of their other, um, data centers that they have. And a question could be, 
is that because it's had lack of human interaction. So I find the, I was very lucky to actually get to spend some time with the team who developed that um, when I was at Microsoft and they're such an interesting bunch of people that they're, they're fascinating to talk to because they're really thinking about what the future looks like. And that's not just the future from um, a cost perspective, a marketing perspective or an engineering perspective. It's, it's really from how they can be more environmentally friendly and carbon neutral. Um, and I really feel that as, as an industry, we have taken this on board over the last few years and are really running with it. But I wanted to go back to something else that Kate said about transparency. And when we're thinking about designing and building data centers, one of the key things that I think is critical for us when we're looking at our carbon footprint and sustainability and our environmental impact is actually not just looking at us as an operational data center, but going the whole way down our supply chain and understanding how the component parts that we're using are manufactured. So are they using um, good wastewater techniques so they're not putting an, an impact into areas that have low water, that they're getting their metals from a sustainable um, source in a sustainable way and not creating major other environmental impacts by getting those metals. And at the moment, I think around the world, not just as an industry, we are having a, a lack of transparency around how things are manufactured. Um, and until we know that, and until we can really chart every component from how it began its life as a a piece of iron ore or what have you and then how it came to be part of our structural steel in our data center it's going to be quite tricky for us to, to really certainly as a team measure our environmental footprint but onto NTT and kind of what we're doing to to be more environmentally friendly NTT are obviously a huge organization and our global data centers are, are just a, a chunk of that business and actually NT is our biggest customer and so when we think about what we're doing as a business we are about being driven by NTT Corporation to really stand up our sustainability goals to think about where we're getting um, energy from in the most carbon effective manner that we're, we're using renewable technologies where we can we're looking at raising those set point temperatures using new energy efficient cooling techniques and also, and this is something that I think it is really important, we are designing data centers that are flexible enough to encourage new technologies to be deployed in them. So we're not just sticking with something that is old and tried and tested. We actually have this major innovation lab that's, in, that's based in our London facility where we're bringing new tech in, trying it out. And if it works and we're seeing amazing results, we're then deploying it in our future sites, which I think is a really exciting thing um, that the business is investing in. And we're very, very lucky to, to be able to have the chance and the facility there to test these things. Um, as I say, I think as an industry, the, the way that we're all looking at this collectively as a data center um, collection, is, is really fantastic. There's a lot more talk about it now. There's a lot more pressure on each of us to be more transparent. Um, and I think it's an exciting time for all of us to be in tech because you know we can draw coming into data centers that, that host so much um, data and the stats on the data are fascinating about how they're used, what they're used for. Um, there's a great pie chart that shows you know how much Twitter accounts, the amount of data traffic around the world and emails and now Zoom and things like this have really taken on a, a huge chunk and it's wonderful to be part of the first virtual panel for, for this group. Um, and so I think just to kind of conclude what, what we're all thinking as an industry, we're set raising the bar for what we're trying to achieve. We're driving this from within the industry. We're not waiting to, to ask, have you know, a government push it for us. Um, and, and we're trying to be much better than we have been. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, now, um, Kimberly, if you'd like to, uh, from NTT, would you like to ask for Kimberly from Bird and Bird. 
please. From bed and bed. Yeah, I've not got the right expertise for NTT to be a member of NTT. <laughs> but um, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me to join the panel this afternoon. So. Um, as you very kindly introduced me at the beginning, I'm a lawyer here at Bird and Bird. I specialise in technology and communications projects. So that means day to day I kind of work with technology uh, companies that are trying to implement uh, or roll out solutions for customers. Or on the other side of it, it's just customers that are trying to buy in tech, which they may have varying degrees of expertise on the tech they're trying to buy. So, so topics exploring the ways in which tech can actually help uh, or would be used as a force for good is obviously quite close to my heart and I will be taking a slightly different approach um, which is to look at how technology when coupled with data and the right level of regulation um, can be used to drive green innovation. So I will be having a brief look at a case study looking at electric vehicles specifically um, as it's a good example of how that all works. So I think I mean, the transport sector accounts for around 25% of greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. And a key component of the government's net zero strategy is that we're going to have consumers moving away from uh, diesel, petrol, and even hybrid cars to pure electric by 2035. Um, so I think there can be no doubt that the mass adoption of electric vehicles is going to go a long way to decarbonizing the transport system. But a move to EVs on a mass scale gives rise to a whole load of other questions and concerns, such as will grid have the right amount of capacity? Uh, will it be able to cope with the extra demand that will inevitably be placed on it? I think the estimate is that if everyone moves to EVs, we'll be looking at maybe 30% increase on demand for electricity supply by 2050. Um, how will we deal not only with extra capacity, but peaks in demand? So if everyone decides they want to plug in their EV on the driveway between 5 and 7 p.m. the evening, um, what is that going to do to the grid? How do we know, ensure that we have enough charge points in the right places to convince consumers to go electric and make the switch? And will those networks actually be secure? So obviously the electricity the security of the grid and the net electricity work, uh, network is an absolutely crucial thing. So that's what I'm going to be exploring over the next few minutes. Obviously, there's a whole, this topic's an interesting one because it covers the energy sector, the automotive sector, there's a whole interplay of issues that arise in both, but I'll just need to focus on a few um, areas in the time that I've got. So to provide a bit of context, it's probably worth first looking at where we're at with EV uptake at the moment. So although uptake is steadily increasing in the UK, EVs account for only, well, less than 5% of all cars on the road at the minute. Now, there's, from a consumer perspective, there tends to be three reasons which are cited as being barriers to mass uptake, um, although there probably are a few more than that. But the key ones are the cost. So EVs tend to be more expensive than their fuel one counterparts. There's range anxiety, which is essentially, is the vehicle going to get me from A to B? And experience anxiety, where am I going to charge it? So those are kind of some of the key concerns. Now, the government's recently outlined some ambitious plans. Um, we had the first, the inaugural World EV Day last week, um, which admittedly I only actually found out about very recently. Uh, and they've announced lots of funding, so 12 million in funding for groundbreaking EV projects, future plans for green colored dedicated parking spaces, super fast charging, um, a try before you buy scheme for businesses, which is an interesting one. But the reality is that really one of the biggest issues that we'll need to be overcome is where is the electricity going to come from and can the grid cope? So this is where the role of technology comes in. So first of all, we have smart charging and that's one of the ways to ease the impact of demand. So that's a, a concentration at peak times. So in a nutshell, the aim is really to encourage consumers to use electricity when the supply is plentiful and demand is lower. So we're all used to a firm connection to the grid. You flick on a switch at home and the electricity or the lights come on any time of the day or night. But consumers might be willing to accept restrictions on when they can charge their EVs if they will benefit from a price increase or avoid a price, sorry, benefit from a price decrease or, or or avoid a price increase. Um, there have been a number of smart charging trials already and the Electric Nation trial from 2017 to 2018 is a good example of that. Now, how that worked was participants were uh, provided with access to an app. They had their electric vehicle charging managed by a smart charging system. 
and they were able to interact with the charging system in order to select either a high priority charge. So if they knew that they were doing a long journey first thing in the morning, they'd be able to say, we want to override the charging management and we can just take our vehicle and do what we want with it straight away. Or they could select optimum charging, which would mean you're charging when the grid tells the system that there is most supply and the cost is at its lowest. So I think overall the, the outcome of the trial was that it was pretty successful, people really liked it and they were willing to accept some restriction on when they were able to charge as long as there were some incentives coupled with it. So good news so far. The, that doesn't however address the bigger issue of where the capacity is actually coming from. So the, uh, vehicle to grid technology, V2G, is the next step along from that and that's what that's designed to address so the average vehicle spends around 90 percent of its life actually parked on a driveway parked in a car park or maybe at heathrow longstay car park but for the most part you're not actually driving your vehicle so if you've got an electric vehicle with a battery that's all potential stored up capacity so the idea is to basically harness that capacity so a driver could store it in the vehicle's battery and then return it back to the grid at times of peak demand and then when it's off peak at night lower cost energy can be drawn back from the grid or even from energy that you've stored in the home to charge the EV when less energy is needed in the home. So there's a lot of stuff that needs to come together to make all of this work. So there's an electric vehicle energy task force um, which brought together uh, it, it, came about last year, brought together over 100, uh, 350 stakeholders from uh, the energy and automotive industries. And they've actually prepared a very comprehensive report and they made a number of proposals to government. So it's, it's kind of worth just exploring a couple of the key themes from that because they were quite interesting. So some of the key themes of the report were consumers really need to be at the center of things. So if they're not, they're not gonna buy in and there's no market and then there's no investment and it's a slightly chicken and egg scenario. but Essentially, what it means is making sure that the systems making up the EV market are interoperable at technical level. So the interactions between the systems in the, in the chain are invisible to the consumer. They don't need to. It's a bit like you don't need to know how sausages are made. You just want the end product. So that's the consumer experience. You need common security, cybersecurity standards for obvious reasons. Um, access to data that allows a hacker to control the output of a whole load of charge points would have potentially damaging consequences. Um, and then data sharing arrangements. So industry-wide data sharing arrangements would need to be put in place so that, that different members of the supply chain can predict exactly when and where EV charging needs to take place. And then from a consumer perspective, charge point data would need to be open ideally and available so that the individual that's planning their journey will know exactly where the charge points are, whether they're in use at a particular time and how fast they are. So. Uh, so related to this, there was a recommendation that there's a specific data access and privacy framework. So I'm in, I'm in danger of mentioning GDPR here, um, which I'm going to mention just once, which is that, of course, the GDPR is already in place and protects consumers about uh, uh, in terms of the way that their data is accessed, stored, used, deleted, transferred, all the rest of it. But I think given the particular way in which consumer data might need to be used, the recommendation is that there would be a need to be a framework specific to the EV sector. So where we're at now, so the UK government has already mandated that if you want to be eligible for funding for charge points, they'll have to be smart so that they're able to collect and share data. They've got theoretical powers under the Automated Electric Vehicles Act in order to make legislation um, in relation to the implementation of smart charging. They've not done that yet, but they did launch consultation last year and, the, and they looked at a number of things in terms of how best to help industry um, lead the way in the UK in terms of you know how, how smart charging can be rolled out so particular points they looked at is how the government might use its powers to mandate that all non-charging uh, that all charging points have to have smart functionality and meet certain minimum standards so that interoperability, uh, interoperability is made slightly easier and also whether the government needs to introduce regulation uh, relating to charge point data so in conclusion, I think I'm just about running out of time. So I think the main point is that turning EVs from a niche to a mass market, it's not going to be easy task by any means, but using a combination of technology that puts customers in the driving seat, pun 
intended, <laughs> a flexible regulatory framework that allows for common technical standards, the appropriate use of data, um, taking into account, of course, commercial sensitivities, etc., and a centralised approach to the rollout of charging points will all sort of help to make that a reality. Wow. That, that's, that's quite, that's quite, it's a bit of whistle stuff. I apologize. It's quite no, no, a lot no, of ground I covered great, there. Great. It's just a lot of parties getting together to make that happen. Quite, quite exactly. much. Yeah. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, finally, we have um, Janet. Janet, some of the research. I'll we'll just turn off the, the lamp a little bit here. Sure. <laughs> I was losing daylight here. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, thank you for having me. I'm probably not a usual suspect at this event. Um, I was kind of wondering, you know, I get sometimes invited to talk um, about like being a woman in tech, but I'm actually really just an activist at heart. I studied anthropology. Um, I've used technology a lot um, and I've used it in some of the campaigning and advocacy I've done. Um, but I suppose ultimately at this, I am a woman in tech. It'd be interesting if you had more people from the non-for-profit sector in your meetup, or if I'm the only one, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, I started a small charity called the Restart Project, and we basically started after working um, in global development projects and working as, with activist organizations um, in Africa, Latin America, and Asia bringing technology into their projects. So helping them use, um, you know, technology to basically supercharge some of their work. And I guess what we noticed, you know, working in Kenya or um, in an informal settlement in Brazil, or, you know, I, in, in a faraway place, um, faraway island in Asia where the supply chains are pretty fragile, is that basically people use stuff long for longer they really appreciate the things they had they fixed them they were much less likely to just bin something when it failed um even even the people who could afford to just go and go out and get new there was still even those middle emerging middle classes in these places there was a culture of repair and using things for longer and respect for things so you know this growing mountain of electrical waste um which the UN just released a report about this year. There's new data. Um, I believe it's like 53 million tons globally um, is disposed of every year. This was kind of the reason that we started this organization, the Restart Project. Um, we wanted to change this. We wanted. We thought the best way to intervene was to kind of reconnect people with repair and also get them to really appreciate the things they have and use them for longer. So um, we've, some of the other speakers have touched on this, but um, in every consumer item and everything we own, like every little piece of kit that we have, there is an embodied carbon footprint. And there's a footprint that goes beyond that. It's water, it's raw materials. Um, and in fact, I believe someone in the chat has been asking about lithium and the massive impacts on mining and communities. And these are all largely invisible to us. Um, and often when we hear the tech sector talking about its carbon footprint, for example, they're really only talking about the footprint in the use phase. So they're talking about maybe the electricity that you use to charge your phone, or they're talking about the running, the running, um, the running energy used by like the data center. Um, but even in the discussions of the data centers, um, that most of the metrics are around efficiency in use. And they're not about, and what, what was mentioned, and I really appreciate that, is about looking at the supply chains, looking at what went into the construction of those data centers. What is the embodied impact of all of that? And so um, we've been really quite concerned with that. Look, looking at, you know, Apple, um, Apple was one of the first companies to share product reports. Um, they didn't necessarily do it consistently um, but for each of the products, they would give, um, they would estimate, they would share a report on its environmental impact. Now, none of these reports were independently, um, could be independently reviewed or verified, and the methodology was not shared, nor was it a standard methodology, um, but they did it. And from that, we learned, you know, quite early on as activists, wow, these, if you look at the carbon footprint of one device, and then you multiply by two billion devices, <laughs> all of a sudden you have carbon impacts on a global scale of manufacture. So we estimate that the carbon impact in manufacture of mobiles alone is roughly that this, the yearly carbon footprint of the Philippines. 
of a country of 100 million people. So, and if we were to extend the lifetime of a mobile just by one third, so assuming that we're able to, to use phones, those phones for one third longer, that's the yearly carbon footprint of Ireland. Um, so we're talking about massive impacts in manufacture, um, but not only the impacts in carbon, the impacts in mining. So the question around lithium and the connection to EVs is massively important. You know, we talk about um, rare earth minerals, but it's not actually that they're rare. That's a misnomer. They're just really extremely intensive to mine and they, they're complicated to mine. They create a lot of waste. Um, there are huge impacts on communities. So actually there are rare earth elements in Europe. There are, we have reserves here in Europe, but we're not, willing, we're not willing to touch them. We're not willing to mine them because they're often found um, near radioactive elements as well. And some of the costs associated with mining them, environmental costs, are considered to be too great here in Europe. Um, so that's just something to throw out there. And then um, basically, so from learning all of this, we just, we came to the conclusion as citizen activists that we've got to use everything for longer. Now, recycling has yet to play catch up and it's really important that recycling improves and that investment happens there. But first, the first thing we can all do is start to demand that things last for longer and use them for longer. So we started running um, community repair events where we just called people, skilled people, friends, neighbors, to help other people fix things. And the idea is not that it's a free repair shop. The idea is that you would turn up at your community center or your, um, your library and you would learn some skills and you would open, you, you, have, you have to take the screwdriver. You have to try and replace the battery on your Kindle. Good luck. Um, so, and people by doing that learn, they learn that actually the system is rigged and that a lot of products are not being designed to be repaired and that companies are profiting off of this. So we've been collecting data um, on what we've been repairing and what we haven't been able to repair. And we were able to repair in a three hour event about 55% of all of the crazy stuff people bring to us from toasters, tablets. Um, there, and then there's about 20%, which is just absolutely throwaway. There's no way we will ever get into it, find a spare part for it, um, or be able to deal with its terrible firmware or software or whatever. And then there's some stuff in the middle, which is a bit of a battle, which is like, it could be repaired with more hours, but how many hours are people willing to, to, to give, to dedicate to their consumer technology? So there are really like three peer, pillars to what we're calling for as a kind of part of the right to repair movement. Um, and one of them is access to documentation. So you may have tried to open up something before that's kind of sealed in plastic and you can't figure out for the life of you how you're, where's the screw? How do I get in? <laughs> Um, you're going to have to often break things to open them. So it's, it's both access to documentation and design for disassembly and repair. Those are two important pillars. Um, and then a third pillar, which is a big, which is a big area of conflict with a lot of manufacturers is access to spare parts, access to affordable quality spare parts. And a lot of manufacturers, um, have been guilty of making this difficult. Um, um, I am, uh, because we have Microsoft, a representative of Microsoft here on the phone, I, I, on the line, I am going to say Microsoft is like many companies. It has a couple of interesting flagship products that could be really good. And then it, it, it's just completely inconsistent. Like Microsoft just released um, a very not repairable device, the Surface 2. I, I'm, I'm not even like up on all of it, but it basically got panned um, for you know, just the lack of repairability. Um, and Microsoft has done some interesting things, it's, but these, all of these companies are so large. And so for us as citizens, it's really hard to figure out how to hold companies to account based on voluntary commitments. We're gonna need some kind of regulation, some kind of level playing field. And I did understand that Microsoft is, is not always opposing regulation, which is good because many of its peers do. But we're pushing for regulation that promotes those three pillars that will give consumers the ability to use things for longer. Um, at a business to business level, I don't know what this looks like. Generally speaking, um, businesses are more demanding. They get better products, they get better prices 
products for the price. They're able to use things for longer and actually looking at what's happened with COVID, um, I think a lot of companies have basically scrapped the refresh cycle and are, are kind of rethinking how they, how they purchase electronics. So this could be an interesting opportunity. But for consumers and for the individual, we definitely need to learn to repair. We need to get better at it, but we also need that system change at a system level. Um, and we're basically pushing for that in Brussels, um, but also, as you can imagine, here in the UK, we need to <laughs> make sure that we don't get anything less. Um, it's a huge battle in the US too, for those who are kind of watching over there as well. The right to repair battle is just heating up there as well. But I'll, I'd love to take some questions and have some discussion. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Janet. Um, and, and, and thank you again to the rest of our pa panel. Um, so um, yeah, I would like to move into a QA. and a um, We've got some things going on in the chat window here, but I don't know if anybody would like to open up with a question. Um, and if people want to come back, turn their video back on, that would be great. If we could see everybody. Um, does anybody want to want to open up with a question? Shall we um, maybe start with Annette's question <clears throat> and work our way back up, Yasmin? Yeah, yeah, that sounds great, Audrey. Okay, so um, Annette, you've written, um, you know, Janet, great idea, but the, the mobile suppliers encourage consumers to change their mobiles frequently. Yeah, and somebody else has said that they've uh, kept their mobile for a very long time, but actually we get pest pestered to change our mobiles very frequently and you often uh, find that you're not on the best rates and so on if you don't change it. If, we, if you, uh, mm -hmm. as an organization, really go for the mobile operators, we've got NTT on the call, so we can ask, um, well, would that help? You know, we, we kept them another year, as you're suggesting. I'm very happy to do that. Um, let's go for it. But we, we need a change of... of the, of, of attitude, of, of, uh, which you're obviously trying to do, but we need a change of attitude in terms of, of consumers as well, that we don't all go out and change our mobiles when we're asked to, we actually hang on to them. So well, get, yeah. get, tell I me mean, a bit more about your thoughts. Sure, well, we're a charity of about seven people and our budget is probably equal, no, it's less than Samsung spent to take over King's Cross promoting its new, I don't even know what it was, pop-up mm -hmm. shop or some new thing. Um, we're nothing in comparison to them. So ultimately, and I, this is why I think that these commitments, I scrutinize these commitments, if they're just left to the engineers and they're left to the, you know, the, the well-meaning people, like the engineers, the designers, who are already wanting to do the right thing, it's not going to happen. Because ultimately, if, if at a board level, the, you know, the marketing departments are not reined in, and ultimately, if the message is not sent across the organization that things are changing, business models are changing, for example, that we're, you know, can Apple really live off of the mobile? Selling a mobile, can Apple remain the company it is just selling mobiles? I mean, they already are facing this themselves. They're looking at diversifying their business model. And so, but that, but they have to, I mean, for them to meet like their targets, like climate targets. They're going to have to look at the way everything works. And the same with a Samsung or a Microsoft. If, you know, it's great if you take care of your data centers, but if you're still selling throwaway stuff to people and you're pushing and you're promoting it in that way and you're hiring agencies to make people crave the newest thing, or you're not providing software updates, then you're undermining your mission and you should be held to account. That, that's our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a really good point, though, is that, that, that the sustainability is not just about what designers and engineers do. It's bigger than that. It's about the marketing machine that is, that is the engine behind our consumption. Yeah. No, you, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and it's also about uh, boards deciding that they really are committed to uh, the climate change agenda and signing up to that in a way that so far has been a little bit um, you know, greenwashing, uh, et cetera, a, a, little, a little bit not quite strong enough, and some better than others. But I think you know, these sorts of things are absolutely correct. You're right. Um, yeah. Kate, Kate, I wanted to ask you something. Um, you talked a lot about the how um, with Microsoft and what they're doing. And I was just wondering if you had some explicit examples that you could, you could talk us through um, that um, uh, Microsoft's doing to uh, meet their commitment. Yeah, I could until she gets back. Um, I'm Mercedes. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mercedes. 
I really enjoyed the conversation about plants as well at the beginning. It was really nice. Um, yeah, um, we we are part of a non-for-profit organization as well. We focus a lot on teaching and training people how to repair stuff, a bit like the Restart Project. And by the way, there is a, a refurbishing week coming up in, in October here in the UK. And um, one of the main problems that we see is... Uh, it's actually about us as individuals. Uh, it's a bit, I mean, when Janet was saying, she was saying the main objective was not to refurbish. It was to make, you know, individuals realize how difficult it is to actually repair some of the devices that we get. And um, I'm more and more seeing an issue with technology. I mean, during the lockdown, we've been giving away computers to those that didn't have one. And something inside me, even though I love technology, keeps on making, you know, keeps on being uncomfortable of just giving away computers. And I think the main reason is that I think we are a lot, most of us are a bit too dependent of technology. We are even raising the point of um, addiction, if you want, to the internet, to be connected. I don't know if you lost me there. No. Good. To be connected to the internet, to be connected to social media, which is a demand on the way we are. I mean, for example, when we repair computers, one of the main issues we see is that computers are normally very strong and they still have a lot of life on them. It looks like Mercedes maybe had okay. frozen. Okay. Um, well, I have a, a question for Kimberly. Yeah. Um, in your report um, on the electrical vehicles, I mean, it sounds like there are a lot of parties involved. I mean, how far advanced is that? How far away are we from seeing something like this come to fruition? We've got bits and pieces already, but I'm just wondering where we are in the timeline of it. I mean, it doesn't feel like we're hugely far away because I think all the right people are talking to one another. Um, they're all keen to do it. I think one of the key questions is where investment's going to come from um, for the charging infrastructure. And until you know that the demand's going to be there, um, then that investment might not come. But I think in terms of, I mean, the technology's there pretty much. It's, I mean, the technology is actually quite straightforward for the smart charging element. It's just it's like IoT essentially is applications, um, devices, mm. talking to one another. Um, and for the electricity grids part, that's now moving away from analog to a smart grid. So all of these technologies are kind of coming along together at the same time. And I mean, the energy sector tends to be slower to react to change, but actually this may drag it along faster and the two technologies can kind of support each other in that way. Right. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> Yasmin, yeah. can I jump in and ask a question, kind of a follow on? So what is the data center's response to this electric car grid issue? I mean, most of the data centers today are moving into this, you know, they use renewable sources, but they're also a generator of electricity. And are we having some sort of common workforce where or work task force where it's actually feeding into the grid for the electrical car units or is that still just kind of on paper is that one for me or for amy i'm not sure who's best probably amy <laughs> I, I don't know it's a question well, maybe probably a amy would know better <laughs> i think a combination is probably the best uh, i think certainly from from our side we are um actively putting car charging units in our data centers now um, which will be part of our infrastructure that's there as a whole for our teams to encourage them to use electric vehicles when they come to site, et cetera. Um, but as a, as a whole of, of how the industry are looking at combining themselves in a more holistic way with the, with the um, communities they work within, for sure a lot of work around that. So trying to get tied into district schemes and making sure that any that isn't on isn't being pulled out of the the grid and we're, we're not utilizing all the time is being given back into the communities um and certainly what we what we're looking at is trying to be more collaborative with the wider tech sector to look at how innovation coming through technology it can be really attributed to the growth in data usage and Amy, you broke up for um, a part of the end of your uh, response. Would you mind repeating it? Yeah, certainly. Sorry, it, it's. Uh, I live in central London, and the bandwidth on my on my uh, internet is a disaster. But yeah. there we are. Challenges we have to deal with. Yeah. Um, 
so it's just just really about the the collaborative approach that we as a data center as, as a data center industry are looking to take with with other technology sectors and making sure that innovation and advances that we're making across these fields are um are, are really being driven into everything that we do and making sure that we're supporting the wider technology sector okay did you want to add anything to that kimberly the only thing i would add to that is not specific to data centers but in looking at this report as a visual these are all the names of the contributors well, <laughs> that yes. took, and they're from, from, from across automotive, um, technology sector, energy sector, you name it, they were involved. So I'm pretty sure you'll be able to find some data center um, stakeholders in that list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Um, any other questions? Janet, you've asked that question about why aren't we talking about mobility solutions um, and electrifying public transport versus EVs for everyone. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a good question. But I, I do know there's a lot of research going on in terms of EVs, everything from um, uh, transport and um, more efficient green ways of going about it um, to even transport trucks um, being uh, powered uh, more greenly. Um, they're going to be coming out next year with a company called, I think it was uh, Nikola, um, again, named after Nikola Tesla, coming out with huge transports that are supposed to be green or hydrogen cell based, capturing hydrogen and reusing these too. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's actually a fleet of uh, London buses up in North London somewhere. I can't remember the name of the bus station, but that's going to be used, I think, to trial out um, electricity generation and what those buses can do. Um, to, you know, if you're storing electricity in the buses and then they're putting energy back into the grid overnight when they're parked up there. Um, so certainly, I mean, there's lots of other modes of that would benefit from, you know, electric charging rather than just cars as well, which shouldn't be lost in the discussion, obviously. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I am conscious of time. Um, we're, we're, um, we're pretty well at the end of the uh, Q&A section of the evening. Does, if anybody else has another question, we have time for another. Otherwise, I'm happy to um, uh, wrap up. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I, just to say that I shared, I can share it again, but we wrote a blog post kind of making some pretty big questions about these big tech carbon commitments. Um, and they, they, some of them circle back around some of the things we've discussed um, on the call. So I can, I can share it again, but, um, uh, and we're just, our main question is kind of like who checks up on these um, and how, how can we compare the commitments of the various companies? Um, and, you know, yeah, it's involuntary commitments can be good. And, and it, this is a case where companies are very much actually somewhat doing better than government in certain sectors. However, um, with government, we have potentially more mechanisms to hold them to account. So anyway, I'll just put that there if you want to read it. Thank um, you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I want to, uh, again, thank all of our panelists for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for your talks. Um, some thought provoking uh, content and dare I say it, encouraging words um, around what's being done to tackle some of the challenges that we're having with climate change. Um, before we go, I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes um, sharing um, some info on upcoming WIT events. Um, uh, we have several events planned between now and the end of the year, even mention of an event next year. So next week, um, as part of the WIT 20th, the 20th anniversary talks, we've been inviting people have appeared um, over the last 20 years to come back and do a, a fireside chat type session. Um, and next week on the 21st will be uh, Michelle Seneca will be talking with Lauren Miller um, and um, they will be exploring what has changed or not as the case may be for women in corporate culture over the past 20 years. So that's next week on the 21st. In October um, there's another anniversary talk and we will have Audrey uh, Mandela speaking with Sherry Kutu, CBE. Um, the 9th of November, um, we have, we'll have our annual Women Tech Entrepreneurs Panel. That's um, when we're in person. That's usually, I think, one of the events that draws the most people. Always uh, interesting to see the entrepreneurs uh, talking about what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> 2nd of December, there is the WIT, another WIT 20th anniversary talk. And um, I will be doing a fireside chat session with Avril McDonald. Uh, someone who's passionate about um, 
hydrogen, capturing hydrogen and reusing it as a fuel. Um, then the 8th of December, we have, you usually have a holiday party. Um, we're still looking uh, to see what that will look like. It'll obviously be some kind of online event and suggestions are definitely welcome um, to see how we might celebrate uh, the season together. Um, we usually have a Mobile World Congress panel discussion. Um, we usually have it right after the Mobile World Congress. Uh, we didn't have it this year for obvious reasons, and we've got that moved into March of next year. We've got a date of March 24th, and all of, um, uh, yeah, and we're hoping to, again, um, meet for that event at the Digital Catapult building, um, but of course, we won't know that until closer to the date. So all of the events and uh, links to sign up are on our website at witgroup.org. So please take a look and you'll see all the information there. And just a reminder that all of the events for the foreseeable future are going to be held on Zoom and everybody is free to attend. So um, we just ask that you uh, register in advance so we know you're coming, okay? So finally to close, thank you so much again to our panel, for everybody for joining us for this inaugural virtual event. We look forward to seeing you in the months ahead. Thank you very much. And if anybody wants to stay on and just chit chat, um, please feel free. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the Bye. rest of your evenings. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.